So yesterday was Christmas Day. Who knows what today is? Day after Christmas. Very good. <laughs> the Brits should know what day it is. Actually, legally, it's not yet. Today is Boxing Day. Anybody know what Boxing Day is all about? Fighting for all those deals in the stores? No. Has nothing to do with the sport of boxing. Also doesn't have anything to do with football games or horse racing, which is big in Scandinavia this time of year. It also happens to be St. Stephen's Day. St. Stephen the Martyr, as opposed to at least two other St. Stephens that we know of. One, Stephen of Sweden, who evangelized to the Norse and the Swedes and actually was martyred for the faith. And the other is St. Stephen, also known as Stephen I of Hungary, who basically was the first king of Hungary. But they have their own days. Stephen of Sweden in June and Stephen I in August. But in Great Britain today and other parts of the former British Empire, they celebrate what's called Boxing Day. Canada, Indonesia, they still celebrate in Indonesia less than they used to. Hong Kong, New Zealand, Australia, Wait, I didn't say that right. Australia. And there's different theories on the origin of what Boxing Day is. The name itself didn't come about till later, but beginning as early as the 10th century, local churches would put an alms box in the narthex of the church, and people would donate all year long to the poor. And it said that on St. Stephen's Day, on the 26th of December, the alms box would be opened and the funds distributed to the poor. But there's also another idea that actually pretty much makes more sense to me. And that idea is that it was a day for giving of gifts to staff and servants, tradesmen and craftsmen who'd done a good job during the year. The first mention of that is actually um, in 1663 in the journal of uh, parliamentarian named Samuel Pepys, he wrote of, about traveling by carriage to visit his cobbler. Anybody know what a cobbler is? Kids, what's a cobbler? Anybody know? They cobble stuff. No. What's a cobbler? And no, not the dessert. Huh? Shoemaker. Guys who, it's that guy who fixes or makes shoes. I guess because you do sort of cobble shoes together, don't you? But he traveled by carriage on December 26th to visit his cobbler to settle his bill for the year and give him a tip and a gift. The name Boxing Day first appeared in, 18, in print in 1833. Four years later, Charles Dixon men, Dickens mentioned it in... The Pickwick Papers. That same year, Victoria became queen. And under Victoria, Queen Victoria, Boxing Day began to take on a whole new meaning. And in 1871, it was finally made a legal bank holiday. 
And there we get into the legalities of when the holiday actually is. Because it's a day off for bankers and most employees. And so if Christmas falls on Friday and Boxing Day is on Saturday, it's celebrated by giving them the day off on Monday. But this year, Christmas was on Saturday. Boxing Day is Sunday. Christmas Day day off is tomorrow. And so Boxing Day is legally celebrated on Tuesday. And if you think that's confusing, you should see some of the other things I found about Boxing Day. But a tradition was formed where wealthy landowners and the elites in the city would give their servants and staff the day off on the day after Christmas and present them with a gift or a tip or a Christmas bonus and often with leftovers. Anybody have leftovers from yesterday? Why do we always make 10 times as much food as we can actually eat? And then what do we do with it? We have leftovers until we get sick of leftovers. And then what do we do with it? We throw it away. At least the Boxing Day tradition says we box it up and we give it to our staff, to our servants, to our friends, to take home to their families and spend the day with their family. As time progressed and it became more of a legal holiday and day off, led to merchants having after Christmas sales. Sort of like our Black Friday here in the U.S., a big day for sales. And it is here in the U.S. too. We just don't call it Boxing Day. But there's all these great sales of the junk that we didn't buy for Christmas. It's all on sale today. So you can run right out and get a really good deal on some junk. But another thing that happens today, and having spent years working in a retail environment, I can tell you that this is the day that people come in and absolutely must exchange what they got for Christmas for something else, even though what they're bringing in to exchange is on its third set of batteries already. It's almost worn out, but they're here to exchange it. And the interesting thing about this time of year, and about today in particular, is you can get some really good deals on an exchange. You can trade up. Because if you have a receipt, it specifies the value of what you had. And you can now get something that's on sale for less than it was when your gift was purchased. And that sounds like a really good deal to me. But the other thing that happens is if you don't have a receipt, you get the value of what your gift is selling for today, which is also probably a whole lot less than it was at the time it was purchased. Eventually, Boxing Day became a day to go out and push through the crowds and fight with each other to get the best deal. Anybody get a gift card for Christmas? What's that gift card worth? It's got an amount on it, but what's it really worth? Till you do something with it? It's not worth anything. You can carry it around in your wallet forever and say, oh, I got a $25 gift card to Walmart. But until you go to Walmart, it's nothing. And by the way, you can't spend it at Portillo's.
But I want to talk a little bit about what it means to redeem a gift. And for us to be redeemed by a gift. In other words, so... Who's got a Bible with them? Or your Bible app on your phone? Turn to Isaiah 61. I'm going to start with verse 1 of Isaiah 61. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn and provide those who grieve in Zion for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. That sounds like a pretty good exchange for me. Beauty for ashes. What's the significance of ashes? Anybody know? In the old days, what? Huh? I did. Keeping you warm. Well, that nice warm fire will keep you warm. But ashes were a symbol of mourning. When I'm just not really happy and I'm really unhappy, people would mourn by putting on sackcloth. Anybody know what sackcloth is? Kids, what's sackcloth? It's like burlap. It's like that stuff they wrapped around the tree roots, you know, when you buy a tree at the big box store. And it's scratchy and it's itchy and it's not very good cloth. It's not fine linen. It's really nasty stuff. But they would put on clothes made of burlap and sprinkle ashes on their head and face to indicate that they were in mourning. So, when they're getting a crown of beauty instead of ashes, they aren't running around. You're not running around anymore in mourning. Turn to Psalm 30. Another exchange. Psalm 30, verse 11 says, You turn my wailing into dancing, and you remove my sackcloth and clothe me with joy. And you guys can either try to follow me as I go through some of these verses, or we'll just kind of let them go. Because I'll read each one of them. Ephesians 1.7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Colossians 1.13 and 14 says, For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So he has rescued us, but he hasn't just rescued us. He's transferred us to another kingdom, from the kingdom of this world into the kingdom of his son. Not a future kingdom, kingdom of right now. Philippians 3 Verses 20 and 21 says, But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, 
who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that we will, they will be like his glorious body. So we aren't just becoming citizens of a new place, of a new kingdom. We're going to someday get new bodies. Thank you, Jesus. Could use one. <laughs> So, he has redeemed us. He's rescued us. He's transferred us to a new kingdom where we are now citizens, where one day we will be like him, but we are already citizens of that place and of that kingdom. Ephesians 1.13, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. When we become believers, not only are we redeemed, not only do we become a citizen of a new kingdom, but we become part of Christ himself. We are in him and he is in us. And the greatest exchange ever made. Martin Luther refers to it as the happy exchange. Today, many people refer to it as the great exchange. Second Corinthians chapter 5, starting with verse 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors and through God, we're making his, and as though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He didn't just take away our sins. He didn't just pay for our sins. He did. He did both. He became our sin so that we might become his righteousness. It's not just a simple matter of we're accepted. We're not just redeemed. We're completely new. When God looks at it, when God the Father looks at us, he now sees his son Jesus and his righteousness. We aren't just followers of him. We're part of him. A man by the name of Walter Langren Jr. wrote something a few years back. Some of you may have heard it. I'm going to read it. It's just a short story. I saw a sight, a strange sight. I stumbled upon a story most strange, like nothing in my life, my street sense, my sly tongue had ever prepared me for. Hush, child, hush now and I'll tell it to you. Even before the dawn, one Friday morning, I noticed a young man, handsome and strong, walking the alleys of our city. He was pulling an old cart with clothes bright and new, and he was calling in a clear tenor voice, Rags, 
Ah, the air was foul and the first light filthy to be crossed by such sweet music. Rags, new rags for old. I take your tired rags, rags. Now this is a wonder, I thought to myself, for the man stood six feet four and had arms like tree limbs, hard and muscular, and his eyes flashed intelligence. Could he find no better job than this, than to be a rag man in the inner city? I followed him. My curiosity drove me, and I wasn't disappointed. Soon, the rag man saw a woman sitting on her back porch. She was sobbing into a handkerchief and shedding a thousand tears. Her knees and elbows made a sad X. Her shoulders shook. Her heart was breaking. The ragman stopped his cart, and quietly he walked to the woman, stepping around tin cans, dead toys, and pampers. Give me your rag, he said gently, and I'll give you another. He slipped the handkerchief from her eyes. She looked up, and he laid across her palm a linen cloth so clean and new that it shined. Yet she was left without a tear. This is a wonder, I breathed to myself, and I followed. Um, then he began to pull the cart again, but the ragman did a strange thing. He put her stained handkerchief to his face, and he began to sob. his shoulders shaking, yet she was left without a tear. This is a wonder I breathed to myself, and I followed the sobbing ragman like a child who can't turn away from a mystery. Rags, rags, new rags for old. In a little while, when the sky showed gray behind the rooftops, I could see the shredded curtains hanging out of blackened windows. The ragman had come to a girl whose head was wrapped in a bandage. Her eyes were empty. Blood soaked her bandage. A single light of, line of blood ran down her cheek. Now the tall ragman looked upon the child with pity, and he drew a lovely yellow bonnet from his cart. Give me your rag, he said, tracing his own line on her cheek, and I'll give you mine. The child could only gaze at him while he loosened the bandage, removed it, and tied it around his own head. The bonnet he set on hers, and I gasped at what I saw. For with the bandage went the wound. Against his brow it ran darker, more substantial blood, his own. Rags, rags, I take old rags, cried the sobbing, bleeding, strong, intelligent ragman. The sun hurt both the sky now and my eyes. The ragman seemed more and more in a hurry. Are you going to er work, he asked a man leaning against a telephone pole. The man shook his head. The ragman pressed. Do you not have a job? Are you crazy, sneered the other. As he pulled away from the pole, it revealed that his right sleeve of his jacket was flat, the cuff stuffed into the pocket, for he had no arm. So, said the rag man, give me your jacket and I'll give you mine. So much quiet authority in his voice. The one-armed man took off his jacket, and so did the rag man, and I trembled at what I saw for the ragman's arm stayed in its sleeve. And when the other put it on, he had two good arms, thick as tree limbs, but the ragman now only had one. Go to work, he said. After that, he found a drunk lying unconscious beneath an old army blanket, an old man, hunched, wizened, and sick. He took the blanket and wrapped it around himself, but for the drunk, he left brand new clothes. And now I had to run up, run to keep up with the ragman. Though he was weeping uncontrollably and bleeding freshly at the forehead, pulling his cart with one arm, stumbling for drunkenness, 
falling again and again, exhausted, old, old and sick. Yet he went with a terrible speed. On spider's legs, he skittered through the alleys of the city. This mile, then the next. Then he came to its limits, and then he rushed beyond. I wept to see the change in this man. I hurt to see his sorrow, and yet I needed to see where he was going in such haste, perhaps to know what drove him so. The little old rag man came to a landfill. He came to the garbage pits, and I wanted to help him in what he did, but I hung back, hiding. He climbed a hill. With tormented labor, he cleared a little space on that hill. Then he sighed. He laid down. He pillowed his head on a handkerchief and a jacket. He covered his bones with an old army blanket. And he died. Oh, how I cried to witness that death. I slumped in a junk car and waited and mourned as one who has no hope because I had come to love the ragman. Every other face had faded in the wonder of this man, and I cherished him, and he died. And I sobbed myself to sleep. I didn't know, how could I know, that I slept through Friday night and Saturday in its night too. But then on Sunday morning, I was wakened by a violence, light, Pure, hard, demanding light slammed against my face. And I blinked and I looked and I saw the first wonder of all. There was the rag man folding the blanket most carefully, a scar on his forehead, but alive. And besides that, healthy. There was no sign of sorrow or age and all the rags that he had gathered shined for cleanliness. I lowered my head, and trembling for all that I had seen, I myself walked up to that rag man. I told him my name with shame, for I was a sorry figure next to him. Then I took off all my clothes in that place, and I said to him with dear yearning in my voice, dress me. He dressed me. My Lord, he put new rags on me, and I'm a wonder beside him. The ragman, the ragman, the Christ. Isaiah 53, starting with verse 3. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took upon took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that bought us, brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. The rag man. That's what it means to be redeemed. We give ourselves to Jesus. He replaces our sin with his righteousness. And he takes our sin and suffers our fate as his own. So let the redeemed of the Lord say so.